All right. Just a little bit of a, eh, not a warning. It's, uh, this whole Daniel series is it's going to be pretty challenging because we're dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. I can't really chicken soup for the soul this message series. And so I hope you came ready to really hear the word um, and to be challenged by it. Last weekend, we, all of our Sunrise campuses, began a new message series that we have titled Believers in Babylon, where over the next seven weeks, we're going to be taking a look at the book of Daniel and the lives of four men who demonstrated faith and a whole lot of courage in a culture and a society that not only hated God, but wanted to force these men to abandon their faith and bow down to the gods of Babylon. And I believe that the series is very relevant to you and I because I believe that we live in a place that is very quickly becoming a modern day Babylon a culture that is increasingly becoming hostile toward God as well as Christians. And before I get started, I feel like the title of our series here needs a little bit of explaining. I mean, like, what is Babylon? Well, Babylon was a very real city that existed in the middle of what is now modern-day Iraq. It's now called Al-Halal. But in the Bible, Babylon, the name Babylon, is synonymous with evil. In the book of Revelation, we see that Babylon is called a home for demons. It's called a hideout for every foul spirit. Now, how did Babylon earn that kind of a reputation? Well, as you look back in the book of Genesis and the story of the Tower of Babel, we see that the foundations of Babylon were built on arrogance and pride, where this group of people decided that they wanted to build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that they could name, make a name for themselves. Now, when you see that, you, you realize that those words are very similar to the ones that are found in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, when he speaks of the devil and his fall, uh, where it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven and exalt my name above the stars of God. And so we see here that Babylon represents that philosophy of life and that cultural pool that tries to convince us and tell us that we are the most important person in the world and that we are the God of our own lives. And it's pride. And pride is the root of all sin. That's why the old proverb says that pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. And that's because pride Pride causes us to turn away from God in self-confidence and self-sufficiency instead of humbly turning to God. And what should concern us as Christ followers is that today we live in a culture that is all about self-absorption. It's all about pride and it's all about making a name for ourselves. And even worse, we live in a society that is increasingly becoming hostile toward God and Christianity, and it's only going to get worse. You know, in the last 50 years or so, society's response toward Christianity has gone from a certain amount of, of respect and maybe even acceptance, acceptance of the idea that we're uh, one nation under God to what is now a patronizing and marginalizing attitude of open hostility toward those of us who claim to follow Christ. I want to share with you a quote that Pastor James shared with our pastoral staff. This is from an article written by Stephen McAlpine from the Gospel Coalition. Listen to what he says. If the last five or six years are any indication, the culture is increasingly interested in bringing the church back into the public square. Well, that's awesome, right? No, it's not, because look at what they said. The culture is increasingly interested in bringing the church back into the public square, but not in order to hear it, but rather in order to lash it and to render it naked and shivering before a jeering crowd. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but as you watch the news, the media is using every opportunity to make the church look stupid and hateful and intolerant. 
And that's by no accident, that's by design. They're working very hard to paint a picture of Christians as a bunch of lame, irrelevant nut jobs. And it's working. Now when you see this image, for instance, how does it make you feel? Now for those of you who don't know who this is, this is Kim Davis. She is this woman who refused to sign her name on the marriage certificate of a gay couple. She's all over the news. Now I know, I'm not trying to trivialize the issue because I know it's very important. It's also very complicated. But I hope that you understand that this stuff is just a sideshow. This is just a smokescreen. News stories like this are purposely thrown at us to divide our nation. To draw lines in the sand between those of us who believe and those of us who don't. And not only that, news stories like this are doing a fantastic job of dividing the church itself. Half of this room thinks that this woman is a, a white version of Rosa Parks. Seriously, I read an article like that. Admiring this woman. The other half thinks that this woman is not doing Christianity any favors. And so we're divided. And I'm not trying to say who's right or wrong, it's just that's what's happening. And in the process, the world is turning against us. And as time goes by, it's going to become increasingly more and more difficult for us to comfortably make our home here in Babylon, like Pastor Rocky challenged us to do last weekend. And in the years to come, it's going to take a lot of God-given strength and courage and faith to be a believer in Babylon. And so what we're going to do is take a look at the life of Daniel and his boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they show us how to live with faith, hope, and courage in a society that wants nothing to do with our God and is trying to do everything it can to make us conform to the philosophy and the pattern of this jacked up world. And so I want you to turn to, with me to the book of Daniel. We're going to be looking at chapter one. If you pull out the chair Bible that's underneath your seat, which I would encourage you to do because I'm going to just tell you right now, we're going to basically read the whole chapter. So you get a pass. You don't have to read the Bible the rest of the week, okay? No, I'm just kidding. You do. Don't, don't take me seriously on that. You're going to turn to page 667 in your chair Bible, and we're going to begin uh, at verse 3. But before we do, let me just set up the scene really quickly here. Uh, at this point in history, God's people are divided into two kingdoms. We have Israel and Judah. Both of them have basically turned their back on God. Something encouraging for you to know is that our kids, uh, our third through fifth graders, are actually learning about these two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, in our children's ministry. But... Anyhow, both of these kingdoms have turned their back on God. And since God would rather have his people living in captivity in a pagan land than live like a bunch of pagans in the Holy Land, he decides to go ahead and allow these um, children of his to be conquered by other kingdoms and sent into exile. It sounds harsh. But Israel was taken over by the Assyrians. And Judah, the other kingdom, was given over to King Nebuchadnezzar and taken into captivity in Babylon. And that's where we begin here in verse 3, where it says, The king Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. And he said, Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning and that they're gifted with knowledge and good judgment and that they're suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. And the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they'd enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of these young men who were chosen from the tribe of Judah. But the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. These are the ones that we're more familiar with. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. And we're going to just stop there for a moment because I think what's happening here at this point is kind of interesting. These boys, and they were teenagers at the time, were hand-picked for the very special privilege of serving in the royal palace of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, they were still captives, but they were seen as the best and brightest among Judah. They were basically the cream of the crop. 
And they were going to be trained in the language and the science and the literature of Babylon and given the best food and wine from the king's own kitchen. So this was a very great honor for these boys. But it was also going to come at a great cost because in order for these teenage Jewish boys to be trained as officers in the king's palace, they were going to have to spend three years being immersed completely in the culture and traditions of Babylon. They were going to be spending three years being trained to think, act, and believe like a Babylonian, which meant that they were going to lose any connection with their homeland and to their people, and most importantly, to their God. Because to become part of the Babylonian culture meant that they were going to have to violate some of their long-held beliefs and traditions. And what I find interesting is how much Daniel and his boys were willing to tolerate before finally drawing a line in the sand. I mean, even their names alone went against their faith in God. Check this out. In Hebrew, the name Daniel means God is my, jo uh, God is my judge. But the Babylonians said, forget that noise. And they flipped, their name, flipped his name over and changed it to Belteshazzar, which means Bel protect his life, which is basically like me changing. If we said, Pastor Mike, we're not calling you Pastor Mike anymore. We're, we're going to call you I love the devil or something. like. That. I mean, it's that drastic. It was the complete opposite of everything that he believed in. And they did the same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at the Mishael at one point meant who is like God, flipped it to who is like Aku, who is their uh, moon god. What we see here is these guys, their names were, that they were given back home in Judah reminded them, every time mom called them home for supper, reminded them of the God that they served and loved so much and that they were committed to. But now their names were just a bitter reminder of their captivity and all of these false gods of Babylon. And yet we read nothing about Daniel or the other fellows trying to fight it. They're just like, call me Sue, I don't care. They didn't really push back on it. Now, on top of these horrible names that they were given, these boys also had to study and familiarize themselves with some of the customs of the Babylonians that were contrary to the law of Moses. Because if you wanted to be one of the king's official counselors, well, then you had to know how to read omens. You had to know how to interpret dreams. You, know, you had to know how to read the future. And so they had to learn about all the gods of Babylon and they had to study the system of astrology that was the foundation of their science and their religion. They had to work alongside sorcerers and, and enchanters who specialized in casting spells and, and, and incantations. They had to work with astrologers who studied the movement of the stars and how they affected um, uh, world events. And they had to hang out with diviners who claimed to see into the future. You know, all of these things were considered sinful and an abomination according to the law of Moses. And again, we read nothing in the book of Daniel that would give us the idea that they tried to isolate and separate themselves from these Babylonian men and their sinful ways. And my point in this is that these fellows were willing to engage with and take part in the Babylonian culture to a very significant degree. And we see that they didn't take a stand against every single thing that went against their own beliefs and traditions. And when it did come time for them to finally take a stand for what is right and take a stand for their faith, faith they didn't do it by pointing a finger at everybody. What they did was they pointed the finger at themselves. Look at what I mean here as we go back to verse 8 here. Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. So he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. And he said, now God, and I want you to remember this part, now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Remember that, they're friends. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat his food and wine. And if you become pale and thin compared to the other boys, I'm afraid the king's going to take my head off. But then Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel and his friends. And he said, look, 
Test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. And at the end of those 10 days, see how we look compared to the other boys who are eating the king's food. And then make your decision in light of what you see. It's important. In light of what you see. And the attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and, attend, and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who'd been eating the, king, uh, the food assigned to them by the king. And so after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and the uh, wine provided for the others. Okay. What I want you to notice here, that is in verse 9, it said that the chief of staff, the Babylonian attendant who was put in charge of these boys, had respect and affection for Daniel. I think that's awesome that two people whose culture and beliefs and way of thinking couldn't be more different, uh, they were able to remain friends. But there came a point in the relationship when Daniel's love for God took priority over his friendship with Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff. Daniel knew in his heart that he couldn't just go along with what his friend was asking him to do. He had to draw a line in the sand. And what I want us to see here and what I love about Daniel is that he opposed uh, the king's attendant with respect and with grace. He didn't flip over the banquet tables and he didn't stage a protest. He didn't condemn the eating habits of the chief of staff or anybody else for that matter. He didn't act like a jerk. He just said, watch my life. Watch my life. Let me show you that living God's way is much better than living according to the prideful, self-sufficient, arrogant ways of Babylon. He said, See how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. And then make your decision in light of what you see. In other words, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. And these men had enough faith and confidence in God that they were willing to allow their lives to be put under a microscope. They said, look at my life. Look what happens when they do that in verse 18 here. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered into the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. These men became influencers in the Babylonian culture. Because of their faith, because of their confidence in God and their unwillingness to compromise, these men were able to influence the culture that God had placed them in. And God wants us to do the same thing here as we live in this modern-day Babylon. Again, we live in a culture that is quickly becoming just like the one that Daniel and his boys were stuck in. But here's the thing. As bad as things are getting, it's only going to get worse. Now, Daniel, if you don't know this, is a book of prophecy. It's a book of prophecy. In fact, a lot of people discount the truthfulness of this book of Daniel because the prophecies found there with regard to hist historical events are so accurate that they say, dude, there's no way. They, that somebody wrote that looking like in hindsight, 2020. They don't even believe that the book of Daniel, naysayers, is true because of how accurate the prophecies are. Well, I believe that they're accurate because they're accurate. God knew exactly what was going to happen and things are going according to plan. Now, here's the thing. I'd be, although we're not going to be focusing on the, you know, sort of the end times prophecies that are spoken of in the book of Daniel, I think I'd be doing us a huge disservice by not letting you know that according to the book of Daniel, we ain't seen nothing yet. Look at what he says in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, there will be a time of anguish 
greater than any since nations first came into existence. That's yet to come. A time of anguish greater than any since nations first came to existence. But, and here's the good news, at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Praise God. He said, unless those days are shortened, right? No flesh would be spared. So listen, I'm not going to go there too much, but what I want us to see is, you know, we live in tough times. There's several examples of how this great nation of ours is slowly pushing God out of the picture. Let me just show you a few quick examples from the news. Over the summer, uh, the Oklahoma um, Supreme Court ordered the removal of the Ten Commandments monument from their state capitol. And this was at the prompting. This happened because a bunch of Satanists who wanted a statue of Baphomet placed there next to the Ten Commandments ended up forcing the hand of the Supreme Court, and so they removed it. Crazy. And then there was a, this was crazy here too. There, uh, over in West Virginia at the school, there is a prayer ban. Now, we all understand that there needs to be a separation of church and state. Okay, whatever. But this takes it to a different level. What this ban does, it makes it so a kid enjoying their chicken nuggets at lunch can't even pray. They can't even bless the food because of this ban. That's crazy. Here's another one where uh, two weeks ago, this high school football team decided they wanted to have a bunch of baptisms on the field. This was off school. The school wasn't in session or anything. Well, you can imagine what happened. It didn't go over very well. Activists over here on the next slide trying to get the words under God removed from our Pledge of Allegiance. Give me a break, man. It's crazy. The course of our nation is, it's sad, it's infuriating at times, and it's scary. But here's the thing, it's only the beginning. We're still free to express our love for God the way we want to. We can still gather like this without fear of having our heads cut off. Most of us don't face any real persecution or ridicule for our faith. It doesn't cost us a whole lot to call ourselves a Christian in 2015. But one day, but one day, it just might. And I think one of the best lessons that we can learn from the book of Daniel is the importance of living a life of faithfulness and integrity when the stakes aren't high. What I mean is that the chief of staff, the guy put in authority over Daniel, was his friend. He loved Daniel. He didn't force Daniel and the other fellows to eat the king's nasty food. He didn't threaten them with death or punishment. Daniel's life wasn't on the line and the stakes weren't all that high. And his defiance at this point of the story wasn't a public spectacle. But when it came to violating a very explicit moral obligation to keep one of laws, uh, God's laws, he refused to compromise. And it was almost as though God was using this very private test to prepare Daniel and his friends for the more public tests that they were going to face in the future. It's like at this point, you know, you know, standing up for his beliefs, it didn't really put his life in danger. But later, as we'll see, it most definitely will. And what I want us to consider is that if we can't stand up for what we believe in right now, if we can't go against the grain of um, society right now when the stakes aren't all that high, how are we going to do it when things get really crazy? When it does cost us something to follow Jesus. When we do find ourselves in that very horrifying end times scenario. You know, integrity isn't just doing the right thing when nobody's looking. It is that. But it's also doing the right thing when everybody is looking. It's being willing to do the right thing even when it costs us more than we want to pay. Right now, the world wants us to conform and to follow its standards and practices and adopt its philosophy of life. And 
as Christians, as Bible-believing Christ followers, we don't have the luxury of compromising. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this stupid world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's stated even better if you look at the message version, which I really like. It says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. We are either a conformer or we are a transformer. We're either being squeezed into the world's mold or we are transforming the people and the places around us. And as we just read, Daniel and his friends, they were transformers. And we're going to see in the next several weeks how God is going to use them to transform the minds of powerful kings and rulers and bring glory to God's name in a very pagan land. But not just by saying words, but by uh, um, demonstrating their faith through their actions. Too many Christians right now, it's a lot of talk, but not a whole lot of action. And so I want us to just self-examine ourselves a little bit here. You know, because as, as Bible-believing Christians, as believers in Babylon, we have got to engage the culture around us. You hear this all the time. We can't just sit around in this room hanging out. We need to represent Jesus out there. We really do. We need to be engaged in the culture that we live in. We can't separate ourselves from the very people that God has told us we need to be reaching. He sent us here to share the gospel with those peoples. So true. But there are limits. There just are limits to our participation in the customs of this world. We can't just go along with the flow and everything that this world is deeming right, which is constantly changing. We've got to go with what God says is or isn't right. And that means that there's going to be times when what the world says is okay is going to conflict with what we know is right and wrong according to the scriptures. There's going to be times when we're going to have to draw a line in the sand when we know in our heart and spirit that we're being asked to do something that is contrary to the word of God. The Apostle Paul says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So as we look at our lives, and I have did that to myself this week, can we, can we do like Daniel said and say, look, man, I just can't do that anymore. I got to cut myself off at this point. But look, I'm not trying to condemn you, but just watch my life. See how living God's way has blessed me and my, my marriage and how it's blessed my family and my kids. See how Christ, watch me, see how Christ has set me free from destructive behaviors and addictions. Look at my life and see how God has set me free from guilt and anger and shame. There's this great quote from a dude, um, I wish I wrote it. This guy's a pastor of a church somewhere down south, but he says this, look, there's no more confused message that you and I can give to a lost and dying world than to live a life of compromise and sin and at the same time try to tell people about the transformational power of Jesus Christ. God is not going to use a compromised life to reach a compromised world. That's money. God will not use a compromised life to reach a compromised world, and yet that's what we try to do every day. Holding up signs, talking a good game, but not backing it up by our actions, by a life that's been transformed by Jesus Christ. And so as you look at your life and your interactions with your friends and your family and your coworkers and those who are put in authority over you, have you compromised your faith? Have you compromised your faith? Have you, maybe you love somebody and you care about them, but this person and their, your relationship with them is having a negative influence on your life. And unfortunately, you're more concerned about your relationship with them and keeping that intact and not offending them and not ticking them off. You're more concerned with your relationship with them than you are with your relationship with Christ. And maybe it's time for some of us to draw a line and the sand and take a step back from those really bad relationships. Maybe some of us have gotten so caught up in the selfish 
goal of making a name for ourselves and building a tower, you know, to the heavens, that we've forgotten that our main responsibilities are to, to love one another and to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul and to honor him in the, the lives that we live, to make his name famous, not only by sharing the good news about Jesus Christ, which we do need to do, but communicating the truth of that message through a life that has been transformed by his grace and his love. And I just pray that you and I, that Sunrise, will have the courage and, in, and integrity that Daniel and his friends had Amen. as we try to live faithfully in Babylon.